Good morning, brothers and sisters. I'm sure you've noticed my frustration in not being able to get through the material for each of the sessions, having got behind on day one. So never do that. Uh, and this, of course, has an impact because I didn't even get to the passage in 1 Samuel 10, which is where I'd like you to turn, by the way, which formed the title of Wednesday's session. So it's sort of a bit of a misfit, that title, as it turned out. But we'll come to it briefly this morning in 1 Samuel chapter 10. Now, we saw the three signs that Samuel gave to Saul, which were a pattern of his life and our lives, which ultimately lead to the Gibeah of mighty ones, to the hill of our God. That's where we're heading, but there are conditions, there is a way that that journey must be undertaken. And we saw those principles outlined in 1 Samuel chapter 10 uh, from verses 1 to 6. And we got to verse 7. And there we saw, of course, that there is also another condition, and that is willingness. Let it be when these signs are come unto thee, and they did come to pass, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. Saul had a choice, and so do we. We can allow God to work in our lives to take this journey, or we can refuse, we can be lax, we can just be disinterested. Or we can, as some have done, walk away. We have a choice. Let it be that thou do as occasion serve thee. The AV margin is helpful. The Hebrew is do for thee as thine hand, and that's the word yad, the open hand, the willing hand, shall find. Rotherham translates it, then act thou for thyself, because this is firstly a personal, individual matter. I can't make this choice for you, brethren and sisters, and you can't make it for me. I'm going to follow those signs on my initiative, my desire to take up this journey. Then act for th thou for thyself as thou shalt find occasion. But in so doing, if Saul made that choice, then he would be the captain of Yahweh's heritage and he would lead others along that journey as our Lord Jesus Christ, as the captain of our salvation, has done for us. And here's the principle that is at the baseline of all that Saul could accomplish in his life. He would make the choice, he would decide to go on this path, but it would be God who would take him along it. For God is with thee. And there's the principle. It's a principle that comes out, of course, all over the Scriptures. And those of you who have read Malachi 3 today will know that it appears in that chapter as well. It comes out of 2 Chronicles 15, verse 2, the message of the prophet Azariah to King Asher of Judah. Yahweh is with you while ye be with him. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. We are the arbiters of our own destiny. If we are with our God, he guarantees that he will be with us. If we forsake him, he guarantees that he will forsake us. So who decides? Who decides that we're going to be in the kingdom? Us. We are the arbiters of our destiny. We have the guarantee. We just need to make the choice and follow it through. And in verse 8 we read this. And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings. Now this is where, of course, Saul's first great failure was to occur. He did not wait for the seven days. He got into the seventh and got down to 600 men. Now that's interesting, isn't it? 600 Benjamites were left from whom he came, from one of them, he got down to 600 men and he offered sacrifice. He'd hardly lit the match and Samuel turns up. He couldn't wait the full seven days. But he was Samuel's personal representative. 
You wait for me. I'm coming down. I'm the priest. I'll make the offer. I'll bless the sacrifice. You're my representative. He couldn't wait to go down to Gilgal. Whether this is the one on the plane or another one, I'm not so sure. But we know what Gilgal represents. It means wheel or rolling. The rolling away of the reproach of Egypt. It memorialised rolling away. The dirt and the filth and the reproach of Egypt signifies what we do in baptism. Joshua 5 verse 9. The circumcision of the flesh in the baptism that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. Not literal circumcision. It's a cutting off of the flesh in the spiritual arena. And Samuel was going to offer. Saul was the king. He was not the priest. He needed Samuel to come and officiate. And what were they to offer here in verse 8? I will come down unto thee to offer burnt, sac to burnt offerings and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Burnt offerings? Under the law, burnt offerings symbolise dedication. Mentally, morally and physically. Head first. Fat second. Inwards and legs third. Mentally. Head Fat, that's to do with the, the will of man, the heart of man. Mentally, morally and physically, that was the order. Peace offerings, symbolising fellowship, thanksgiving and the keeping of vows. Very interesting, isn't it? Because that's what Gibeah of Saul is about, keeping or not keeping of vows. And of course, voluntary service. We don't have time to explore all of that this morning. And why the seven days, brethren and sisters? Why does Samuel ask him to wait for seven days? Well, seven is the covenant number. And this is about a man who's been given three signs that have to do with getting him into the kingdom of God. And that's all to do with God's covenant to his people. He will be faithful to it, but will we? Will we wait? for the seven days, so to speak, for the covenant that we believe in, which we know God will fulfil. What about our side of the bargain? Well, Saul didn't keep his. He did not wait for the full seven days. And his success lay in keeping that covenant until the appointed day, and so does ours. And thou shalt tarry, he's told in verse 8. Seven days shalt thou tarry. The word means to wait, to be patient, to have hope. And that's what we're doing, isn't it? I mean, people constantly remind me that in 1979, I got up in a study class, and Rodney's been reminding me of a few things that I've said that I've forgotten that I said. But I got up in a class in Wilston and said, we've just had our first child, she'll never go to school. You've now got four kids going to school. But that hasn't knocked my faith because I believe Christ is coming today. And if he doesn't come today, he'll come tomorrow. You believe that? It's a matter of waiting, isn't it? Patience. Because our hope is sure. We're finite. We don't get everything right. Especially me. But the day will come. And that's what Samuel tells Saul. Till I come to thee. And here is the promise of the return. And it is redolent of the language of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are echoes from this context that come down into the New Testament. Luke chapter 19 verse 13. Occupy! Revelation 2 verse 25. Hold fast till I come. The promise is there for you and me. He's made it and he will come because he keeps covenant and so does his God. He has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. It will come and it will not tarry. When that day comes, the covenant will be kept. But what about you and me? Will we be faithful to the covenant that we have made? That's the question we need to occupy ourselves with. 
I will come to thee and show thee what thou shalt do. The word show, yada, means to know. Rotherham translates it, then will I let thee know what thou shalt do. So what happens to Saul after receiving the signs and the message of encouragement to wait patiently until Samuel comes? Well, verse 9. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. God intervened. Now this word gave is the Hebrew word hafak. It means to turn about, to turn around. God turneth to him another heart. So here is a man who has God working on his heart. He's still doing the same, isn't he? He does it through the power of his word. He goes on to say in verse 10, And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him. So all the things that God told him were going to happen, happened. And it says at the end of verse 10, And the Spirit of God came upon him and he prophesied among them. Now this was a, this was a unique event. This had never happened in Saul's life before. He'd never felt like this before. And I can think back on my life, brothers and sisters, to, to a time when in my teenage years I heard the word of God expounded in such a way that I, it completely overwhelmed me. I had a feeling then that I had never, ever felt before. The power of the word was so great. I was shivering. You ever felt like that? That's what Saul felt. He was overwhelmed by the power of the Spirit of God. Now, it's something that's pretty rare, I guess, in many people's lives. But it's something that one day needs to happen for all of us, whether we be young or old. When you feel absolutely overwhelmed by the power of the word of God, it gets to you. It grabs you. And you become another man. That's what Saul became. And he prophesied among them. And in verse 11... It came to pass, when all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets. Then the people said one to another, What is this that is come unto the son of Kish? Is Saul among the prophets? What does that tell you? Well, what it tells me is this, that he was not known for being like this normally. Nobody had ever seen him like that before. He was not a Bible student. You never saw Saul at the schools of the prophets. He didn't go to Bible schools. He didn't even turn up to study classes. He was a Christadelphian, but he had never been touched by the power of the word. Why do you keep coming back to Bible school? Those of you who are here very often, I'll tell you why I do, because they asked me to come back. But the ones that I'm not speaking at, that I can get to, I come. I'll tell you why I come. It's the best place on earth to be right now. That's why I come. Because brethren who have done the hard work and put their heads into their Bibles and get up and put it forth in a way that grabs you, it's the best feeling you can ever have. Isn't that true? Saul had never felt that way. This is the first time in his life. So it could have been different, couldn't it? He could have stayed a changed man. But he didn't. Because he, he had choices to make, like you and I. He was not known for his spiritual inclinations. Is Saul... Also, among the prophets, that's repeated in verse 12, read on. And one of the same place answered and said, But who is their father? Answer, Samuel. Therefore, it became a proverb. So it becomes proverbial in Israel. You know, Christadelphian grapevine's pretty good. They didn't have internet in those days. There was no Facebook. There was nothing like that. No emails. No telephones. But this message started to get around. People chatted. Did you, did you know that Saul... Among the prophets? Isn't that incredible? 
And this message got around. It became a proverb. They went around, this is a new saying. It's Saul among the prophets. This is amazing. Now you can see why God chose Saul to be the first king of Israel. He was a microcosm of the nation and most of them were like this. Most of the people of Israel were like Saul. They were Christadelphians. They had a heritage. They went to the meetings when they had to. But as for real interest in Bible study, digging into the mind of God, very, very few of them had the initiative to do what Samuel was doing or to join him in his schools of the prophets had other interests. Now that, brethren and sisters, is a challenge for us all. Listen to Brother H.P. Mansfield again. Saul was a failure as a leader in Israel, spiritually uneducated and inept. He proved inadequate for any purpose save his own. Like so many who had gone before him during those dark centuries of Israel's struggle for survival, his downfall was inevitable because he transgressed against the word of Yahweh. It did not mean to him what it should have meant. Do you think Brother Mansfield is in left field? Listen to Brother Robert Roberts in the visible hand of God. And this quotation will take us from where we are now, which is where we should have been on Wednesday, to what we're going to do this morning. Saul proved an unfaithful king. What that means will be discerned by those who understand the difference between faithfulness in its common acceptation and faithfulness towards God. A man is faithful in the common acceptation who performs what he undertakes as between man and man. But a man faithful to God is one who aims at carrying out the appointments of God for no other reason than that they are the appointments of God. Such a man has such an aim because he discerns and is deeply impressed with the fact that all things belong to God and that God only has the right to appoint what is to be done. That comes from the 1850s, 60s. So anybody who thinks I'm pretty harsh on Saul, read your pioneers as well as your Bible. This man was a thick head when it came to spiritual things because he never allowed his mind to be exercised powerfully by the word of God, except when God intervened to show him what was possible. And he showed him what was possible in 1 Samuel chapter 10. I want to now go into another phase of our study. And as you would have seen from the title of this study this morning, this is about performing unto Yahweh thine oaths. Vows, brethren and sisters, must be performed. They are not optionals. This is not something that we can switch on and switch off as we see fit. And God makes this very, very clear in the word. In Deuteronomy 23, verse 23, we read these words. That which is gone out of thy lips thou shalt keep and perform. Even a free will offering according as thou hast vowed unto Yahweh thy God, which thou hast promised with thy mouth. That's how God regards the promises that we make with our mouth. Whether that be in the form of an oath or a vow or a simple promise. A yea meaning yea or a nay meaning nay. We must not mess around with this principle. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 4 you will know very well. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. That's not my word. 
That's God's word for people who don't keep covenant. So what's Saul? A fool. He hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed, because he'll hold you to account. In the Messianic Psalm, Psalm 61, verse 8, this is the words of Messiah in the mouth of the psalmist. 68, 61, verse 8. So will I sing praise unto thy name forever, that I may daily perform my vows. In Leviticus 19, verse 12, the Lord Jesus Christ takes up this language in Matthew 5.33. He quotes Leviticus 19, verse 12, And ye shall not swear by my name falsely, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, which is what you do if you don't keep your vow. I am Yahweh. He interprets that in Matthew 5, verse 33. Again ye have heard that it has been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oath. And then he says to his disciples, Don't even bother making a vow. Don't swear by Yahweh's name or anything else, because my disciples will understand this principle, and when they say they're going to do something, they do it. Their yea is yea and their nay is nay and that's good enough. That's as good as a vow to them because it is going to happen. That's the principle he lays down in Matthew chapter 5. So let's have a look at some of Saul's oaths, shall we? And we see how he treated vows and oaths. Come to 1 Samuel chapter 14. Now, I've got to be quick on this because I was intending to spend a few minutes in this chapter. It'll have to be quick. Well, you're just going to work through 1 Samuel 14. In verses 24 to 28, we know the circumstances. Jonathan and his armour bearer have gone up and taken on the impossible situation of attacking a Philistine garrison. You know the story, don't you? I mean, this man of incredible faith. And of course, when Saul hears the commotion, he gets involved. He brings the army. In verse 24, the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had adjured the people, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food until evening, that I may avenge, that I may be avenged on mine enemies. So none of the people tasted any food. And they came to a place in the wood where there was honey. This, this uh, beehive of wild bees, and there was honey dripping out of it. And we read about that in verse 26. Jonathan, who had not heard his father's oath, verse 27, he had not heard when his father charged the people with the oath. Wherefore he put forth the end of the rod that was in his hand and dipped it in the honeycomb, put his hand to his mouth and his eyes were enlightened. He received immediate benefit from the honey. Then answered one of the people and said, Thy father straightly charged the people with an oath, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food this day. Jonathan puts that in its right place in a moment. So in verse 24, we read that Saul had adjured the people. What does this mean? Well, the word adjured is Allah. It means to put under an oath, a curse, or an adjuration. In other words, it involves the name of God. It cannot be overturned. It must be fulfilled because it involves the name. So this is the reason why the Lord Jesus Christ responded to Pilate, remember? He stood before Pilate and Pilate is berating him with questions and Jesus is standing there. No response. This is the same as the high priest. The high priest said, tell us something. Before the Sanhedrin. Nothing. Until the high priest said, I adjure thee by God. Then he had no choice because God's name's involved. An oath of adjuration demanded a response. It could not be ignored. So it's pretty serious, but it was a despotic oath with a focus on Saul himself that I may be avenged of mine enemies. See, it's all about me, me, I, my enemies. Verse 26. The people feared the oath, and so their acquiescence bound them to it. Verse 27, we saw Jonathan was totally unaware. 
He's now in imminent danger of losing his life because of Saul's oath. And so we go on. In verses 28 to 30, we got down to verse 29. Then Jonathan said, My father hath troubled the land. See, I pray you, how mine eyes have been enlightened because I tasted a little of this honey. How much more, if haply the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies which they had found. For had there not been now a much greater slaughter among the Philistines? There could have been a massive victory that day if Saul had not intervened with his oath. It was an oath of folly. In verse 35, we come down quickly. Verse 35. And Saul built an altar unto Yahweh the same day. It was the first altar that he built unto Yahweh. Well, that's a start, I guess. It's his first altar. But nothing happens. Look at verse 36. And Saul said, Let us go down unto the Philistines by night and spoil them until the morning light, and let us not leave a man of them. And they said, Do whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. You know how I read this chapter, brethren and sisters? Every year we read this in our readings. I have to confess to you, I have a sick feeling in my stomach. Because I try and actually stand there with Jonathan and with Saul and with the people and to relive this event. I have a sick feeling in my stomach because I can see Saul's leadership going like this. That's going to be a disaster for him and a disaster for Israel. He's lost the confidence of his people already. He builds an altar. He says, look, let's, fella, let's get into this, fellas. And they're starving hungry. Nobody can eat anything. Let's go after them. And they said, oh, do whatever you want to do. So they're really with him, aren't they? You know, this is terrible, isn't it? Then says the priest in verse 36, this is a good idea, isn't it? In their exasperation, let us draw near hither unto God. That's a good idea, isn't it? Verse 37, and Saul asked counsel of God. Shall I go down after the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into, my, into the hand of Israel? But he answered him not that day. There was an oath in place, wasn't there? Which he foolishly had made. God's not going to answer until this matter is cleaned up. And we go on and we see the dreadful consequences of this. Verse 38, And Saul said, Draw ye near hither all the chief of the people, and know and see wherein this sin hath been this day. He knew there's a problem here. For as Yahweh liveth, which saveth Israel, though it be in Jonathan my son, he shall surely die. But there was not a man among all the people that answered him. Again, you look at those people and you think, what a herd of lost sheep or lost asses they are. This is their king. If I might be kind, maybe unkind, He's a drongo. He is a drongo. This is the beginning of his reign. Little wonder he fails within a couple of chapters and is rejected by Yahweh. Verse 40, Then said he unto all Israel, Be ye on one side. So he puts all the people on one side and himself and Jonathan, because he suspected who was the troublemaker here. And of course, Saul and Jonathan are taken. Then Saul said to Jonathan in verse 43, Tell me, what hast thou done? And Jonathan tells him the story. He said, well, I didn't know about your oath. I'm totally unaware of it. But I must die. Jonathan's saying, well, I must die. Because you made an oath to Yahweh. I'm your son and successor. But to keep the oath, I've got to die. Now what an unbelievable situation this is. What happens? Verse 45. Saul says, yes, you're going to die. Verse 45. And the people said unto Saul, Shall Jonathan die 
who hath wrought this great salvation in Israel? God forbid! As Yahweh liveth, there shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground, for he hath wrought with God this day. And that was true. So the people rescued Jonathan, that he died not. Then Saul went up from following the Philistines, and the Philistines went to their own place largely intact. They could have destroyed him. Why was he appointed king? To deliver my heritage from the hand of the Philistines. Did he do that? Only partly. Who finished that off? A man who could keep covenant. His name was David. So here we've got this man who makes a foolish oath and it is left unfulfilled. I wonder whether that might have started the rot, brethren and sisters. I wonder whether when Saul was going home from this battle, the people had intervened and said, you're not killing Jonathan. There's no way in the world. He couldn't fulfil the oath. He's going home and he's thinking, well, I haven't been struck by lightning yet. You know, God hasn't sent a thunderbolt out of the heavens to strike me down. Oh, it's only an oath. Started the rot. Because thereafter, he only ever kept one oath. You know what that was? The oath he made to the witch of Endor. Incredible, isn't it? Every other one he broke. So let's follow them. Let's come to 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 25. We know the story. David comes with supplies for his brothers. They tell him that Goliath, the giant, has every man in Israel shaking in his boots. And he says, you're kidding me. Then they tell him that if anyone kills the giant, the king will give him his eldest daughter to wife. And he says, say that again. Is he offering a reward to kill this giant? David couldn't understand that. Why doesn't someone go out there and finish him off? And they said, well, hang on. We'll take you to Saul. And we know the story very well, don't we? Verse 25 tells us, And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel as he come up, and it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. So let's come to the end of the chapter. We know the story. Verse 55. And when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistine, he said unto Abner, the captain of the host, Abner, I've got a question for you. Whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As thy soul liveth, I know everything else, my king, but I can't tell you about the origins of this fellow David. The king said, Inquire thou whose son the stripling is. And of course David comes back with the head of the giant in his hand. So Saul has a problem. He realises that David will soon be his son-in-law. He will have to marry his daughter Merab to David. Now we know that David's already been in the court of Saul, don't we? You go back to chapter 16. And some people got different. I don't have any difficulty with the chronology here. I believe that back in chapter 16, David was brought into the palace of Saul to play his instruments and so on to soothe this mad king who was going mad anyway. And David was there. But Saul had never inquired and said, well, you tell me your heritage, uh, David. Uh, you know, who's your father? Where do you come from? How, what, what's your bank balance? You know, have you got any titles after your name? Whatever. He never asked those sort of questions. But now this man's going to become his son-in-law. He wants to know what his, you know, what his... Uh, bona fides are and what, what sort of status this man has in Israel. You know, have you been to university? Uh, uh, what about your bank balance? Uh, what's your father going to leave you in the will? You know, all those sort of questions that are important to some people were not important to David. Now how do we know that's true? We've just got to read on. Let's just read from 
verse 58, 57 and 58. And as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son art thou, thou young man? And David answered, I am the son of thy servant Jesse the Bethlehemite. Oh, that's a problem. Have a look at chapter 18, verse 2. And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. He was ashamed that he was going to have to marry his daughter, you know, this pristine princess, Merab, with all of the... You imagine she's a princess. He's a king. He's got billions, so to speak. He's going to marry this wonderful eldest daughter with all of this, the prim and properness of a king's house to a dirty little shepherd from Beth, Bethlehem, Judah, Micah 5. Though thou be the least among all the cities of Israel. Bethlehem, Judah, despised. So he doesn't let him go home. Got the picture? Now once you're going home, mate, someone will know where you come from. So he's ashamed. First Samuel chapter 18, verses 17 and 18. David gives Saul an excuse not to keep his promise. Look at verse 17. And Saul said to David, Behold my elder daughter Merab, her will I give thee to wife. I'm going to fulfil my promise. The oath that I made that the man who killed Goliath would have my eldest daughter. I will give, give her to thee to wife. Only be thou valiant for me, etc. But look what David says in verse 18. And David said unto Saul, Who am I? And what is my life or my father's family in Israel that I should be the son-in-law of the king? That's exactly what Saul had been thinking ever since that day in the Valley of Elah. It's exactly what he'd been thinking. And so he says, oh, well, David understands that he really shouldn't be the son of the king. So he gives Merab to someone else. And Merab is given in verse 19 to Adriel the Maholothite to wife. And that is going to lead to a huge, tragic disaster decades later. Now, Merab's name means increase. You think about the, you think about the things that are involved here. He should have given Merab to David. He doesn't. He gives her to Adriel. Her name means increase. She marries Adriel. The flock of God. And so Saul's mind's thinking, well, I don't have to keep my promise to David. He's already sort of cancelled himself out of the equation. So I'll give her to this wonderful fellow, Adriel. And there will be an increase in the flock of God. Wow. I'm going to show you, if time permits, what happens when you don't keep your promises. For these two poor people. Merab and Adriel. Now look, we've got to hasten. More of Saul's oaths. We'll go through them quickly. You know them as well as I do. 1 Samuel 19, verse 6. The oath is, Saul swear, as Yahweh liveth, he shall not be slain. Look back at verse 1. The chapter starts with Saul campaigning amongst his own servants against the life of David. Jonathan intervenes in verses 2 to 5. And so it produces the oath of verse 6. But look at verse 10. Within a few short days, Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with the javelin, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence and he smote the javelin into the wall and David fled and escaped that night. What value would you put on that oath, you reckon? And when you look at Saul's motivation for breaking oaths, they come down to this. We haven't got time to explore these. Indignation, we've seen that. 1 Samuel 18, verse 2. Whose son are you? Jealousy. 1 Samuel 18, verse 8. Saul has slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands. Hated him for it. Fear. As David acted more and more wisely. 
Saul feared him. Pride. 1 Samuel 20, verse 31. He rebukes Jonathan and he says, Don't you understand that if David becomes king, you won't be king? It's all about pride, family pride. Saul's oath to the witch, 1 Samuel 28, verse 10. She says, I think you might be Saul. He says, don't worry about that. And he makes an oath that he will not touch her. It's the only one he keeps. And she didn't even believe in God. Saul and his zeal had sought to eradicate witchcraft, of course. Samuel is going to remind him, as he did 1 Samuel 15, 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. But what about David's oaths? 1 Samuel 18, verse 3. David makes an oath with Jonathan. They make a covenant of mutual loyalty. Was that forsaken or was it kept? Well, it was kept, wasn't it? What about 1 Samuel 20, verses 16 and 17? That covenant was renewed with emphasis on preserving Jonathan's house. It was fulfilled by David in the, in the records that you can see there on the screen. In 1 Samuel 24, 21 and 22, David's oath was made to preserve Saul's name and house. It was fulfilled. In 1 Samuel 30, verse 15, David made an oath to the young, young Egyptian that had been abandoned by the Amalekites. Remember him? Did David keep the oath to an Egyptian? Yes. 2 Samuel 3, verse 35, David's oath that he was not involved in Abner's assassin, assassination. Did he keep that one? Yes. 2 Samuel 19, 23, David's oath to Shimei that he would not die for his sin. Did he keep that one? Yes, Shimei didn't die because of, he, of his abuse of David when he fled from Absalom. He died because he didn't keep the conditions laid down by Solomon, that he remained in Jerusalem. He didn't die for the sin against David. That oath was kept. Thou shalt perform unto Yahweh thine oath. I want you to come in the last five minutes to 2 Samuel 21. Where does this all end up, brothers and, si brothers and sisters? Where does it end up? If you don't keep oaths and vows and promises, well, this is where it ends up, tragedy. Decades later, 2 Samuel 21, verse 1. This is Rotherham's translation. And there came to be a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year. So then David sought the face of Yahweh. And Yahweh said, It respecteth Saul and his house as to, the, as to bloodshed, in that he put to death the Gibeonites. Now, why did Saul put to death the Gibeonites? Well, we'll see in a moment. 500 years before this event, the princes of Israel swore an oath to the Gibeonites. And Saul breaks it. There are these three years of famine for breaking that oath to the Gibeonites. Let's just pick up a couple of words here. Verse 1. David inquired of Yahweh, Bakash Panim. He sought the face of Yahweh. And only a man who keeps promises can come before the face of Yahweh. The Gibeonites, the, mean, the word means a hill city. It's very close to Gibeah, of course, in Strong's lexicon. In verse 2, we read that Israel had sworn unto them. The word sworn is the Hebrew Shabbat, which means to seven oneself. You remember Genesis 21 and 22, when Abraham made a covenant with Abimelech, he brought out seven ewe lambs. And then in chapter 22 of Genesis, which is the seventh promise of the seven that God made to Abraham, that Abraham does seven things several times and then Yahweh says, I have sworn by myself, the word means, to seven oneself. Seven is the covenant number. Israel had made a covenant. 
Verse 3 we read, Wherefore David said unto the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you, and wherewith shall I make the atonement? There needed to be an atonement for the breaking of this covenant. That ye may bless the inheritance of Yahweh. Now David could have made several excuses here, couldn't he? Saul was showing zeal towards the ecclesia. Look at verse 2. It says at the end of the verse, Saul sought to slay the Gibeonites in his zeal to the children of Israel and of Judah. Well, that's a pretty good motivation, isn't it? You've got zeal towards the brotherhood? Well, it's no good if in your zeal to the brotherhood you break an oath that's been made 500 years before. David said, could have said to God, well, look, uh, there is such a thing as the statute of limitations. Surely a 500-year-old oath is extinct. You know, I often hear today, the times have moved on. You know, uh, this is the modern, this is the 21st century. The times have moved on. Not in relation to this matter as far as God was concerned. David could have said, well, why should Israel be suffering for Saul's past actions? This is not our problem. Anyway, I mean, who are these Gibeonites? They're only Gentiles. What part have they got in Israel? He could have made a series of excuses, brethren and sisters, but this was the oath of Joshua and the elders of Israel. Joshua 9, 15. And the princes of the congregation swear unto them, neither the passage of time or the change of circumstances cancel out an oath involving the name of Yahweh. It doesn't matter how long it is. Saul had broken a covenant, Hence, we have the record of 2 Samuel 21, 4 to 6. Let's quickly look at it. The Gibeonites said to him, we don't want any silver or gold. We don't want anybody else killed. We just want this man's sons. Verse 6. Let seven men of his sons be delivered unto us, and we will hang them up unto Yahweh. I wonder where. Where would you hang them up? Gibeah of Saul. That's where they're hung up, because Gibeah is about oaths, the keeping and the breaking of them. So they're hung up. Why seven? Well, it's the covenant number. Now, who are these seven? Well, verse 8, the king took the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Ahiah, whom she bare unto Saul, and they're named. Now, I haven't got time to go through those names. One of them means the speller of shame. And then we read this at the end of verse 8. And the five sons of Michael, the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up for Adriel, the son of Barzillai, to Maholothite. Now this is not Michael. This is Merab, as your margin may tell you. This is the lady who, was, who should have been married to David, who was given given to Adriel. And so Merab and Adriel had to pay the price for Saul's broken covenants. And what happened, brethren and sisters, was tragic. We read in verse 10 that Rizpah, the daughter of Ahiah, took sackcloth because they stuck these seven men. They're grown men. They're not children. They stuck these seven grown men on stakes at Gibeah of Saul. And they hung up there to dry. And Rizpah, the concubine of Saul, spent six months chasing away the birds of prey and the wild dogs and other creatures that came around at night. Day and night, she kept her vigil beside those stakes. And David was to acknowledge her loyalty to Saul. Though he had never made a covenant of marriage with her, she acted as though she had made one with him. And she protected his two sons through her and the five sons of Adriel and Merab for six months, hand up for any volunteers to do that. And what David does in response, we don't have time to deal with now, but what he does in response is to go to, I wonder where, Jabesh Gilead and to bring back the bones of Saul and Jonathan 
and to bury them where? Where? Gibeah of Saul. Isn't that interesting? And God suffered himself to be entreated for the land after this.